pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God,
tennis, boys finished second in the league, then turned around and won the sections. So three of the five varsity sports has had championships in either the Senate State Conference or uh, sectional titles. We had two girls golfers, one girl golfer, they, they competed in New Hartford uh, by way of support. They were not combined in New Hartford, New Hartford's coach and was graciously to take our two girls down there. Three, there was actually three, a seventh grader also, but the two girls golfers have been competing with Notre Dame. They lost their program and dropped it like a week or two before the season started, so it was kind of a scramble and we didn't have enough to formulate a team. So uh, they golfed through New Hartford's schedule and we had uh, Cameron Yearman win the sectional title and then go on to the state tournament. Didn't do as well as she'd like, she doesn't want me to say what she got, but outstanding effort. Um, and Elena Weaver finished eighth in the section. They take the top nine. She qualified, went to the states, and also both of them were in the top half at the state championships for golf. Um, modified baseball and softball, like I said, had successful years. Uh, modified baseball had 16 players. Modified softball had 14. Uh, modified boys track had 22 competing. Modified girls had 21, similar to the varsities. Uh, at our spring banquet, we recognized 50 Center State Conference Scholar Athletes. Whatever varsity letters they earned in combination with an 88 average or above. So if you were a senior, you needed to have earned six varsity letters, 88 average over the career. Uh, juniors would be five varsity letters, an 88 average. Sophomores, three varsity letters. 88 average or higher, and then if you're a freshman or an eighth grader and earned a varsity letter, would the um, scholar athletes earn that? So we had over 50 athletes. New York State scholar athletes, we had over 45. We didn't have a team recognition for that. Uh, you need 75% of your team to have 90 or average higher, uh, but we did put 45, 90 or higher spring athletes for the New York State scholar athletes. Um, two representatives, Caitlin Core and Matthew Hanna for Scholar Athlete. That's 100 schools in Section 3, Watertown, Syracuse, Utica area. Each school is represented by two Scholar Athletes. They went to Onondaga. Mr. Wheelock accompanied them to their award ceremony. It was the same night as our sports banquet, but we had those two athletes. They were given a $100 scholarship, uh, armor all pull, pullover and different aspects of that. Just an outstanding recognition for the two athletes, student athletes with that. Principal awards given to Ellen McCarthy and Zach Murphy. Uh, kind of uh, uh, the athletes that may not get the full recognition compete in three sports and play a contributing factor to their teams while maintaining an excellent average and competing in three sports throughout the year. Uh, most improved athletes this year were Mercedes Martin and Zachary Murphy. The North Award and Most Outstanding Female Athletes went to uh, the North Award is the equivalent of the Outstanding Athlete. Uh, North Award went to Cole Owens, and Most Outstanding Female Athlete went to Angelina Walker. That's about it. One more thing we'd like to do, the Sports Boosters would take, like to take a minute or two of my sports time and present Mr. Wheelock with recognition. Um, Linda Jones will speak because <coughs> he's been a mentor, a friend, comrade, I, I will say that. On the record, people won't believe that we did see eye to eye a lot. A lot of the time. 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 But in his true gentleman fashion, he would get his way. And uh, I'm going to miss him. Mr. Wheelock, we just, um, on behalf of the Sports Boosters, and I have some other, I'm not sure other board members could make it tonight, but we try, myself and Jill are here, um, wanted to present you with a plaque in recognition of your support and commitment to the support that is Sports Boosters and student athletes throughout your career. Your time and dedication are appreciated, presented in June 2023. I want to tell you that I'm going to miss all of my phone calls for asking you about the bomb fire, should we cancel it, should we have it, the times you helped us in concessions, you always jumped up and, and jumped in and, and weren't weren't afraid to you know, put the gloves on and you know, deal with all of it. We're really gonna 
miss you, and if you're ever bored and have extra time, we're always looking for help in concessions. So thank you so much. On it to, to have a superintendent, the events that he attended, not just athletic events, meetings, uh, plays, musicals. Not that, if you're out there, not many superintendents attended what Mr. Wheelock did. Mr. Satan, he cleaned my car, he did a lot of good things too, so if you're listening and you're here, he cleaned out the buses. Is he still here? <laughs> a lot of, so, you know, you got big shoes to fill, Mr. Shady. So we appreciate it. Yeah, Anything that you can do. So thank you, Mr. Wheelock, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Any questions? Before we get to what we're really here for tonight, which is the students, I just wanted to do a very brief summary of what our curriculum, curricular uh, and extracurricular ensembles have been doing this year. Um, we sort of have moved back to our pre-pandemic times, which means we're running around like chickens with our heads cut off. But um, the students, the ensembles, uh, collectively accomplished a lot, and they're not being recognized tonight, so I would at least like to recognize what they've been doing this year. Um, so, first, I'd like to mention Select Choir had a great year of rebuilding under the direction of our newest member, Mrs. Claire Hale. Um, and we had great numbers previously, but what began the year as a choir of six ended the year, uh, she was able to grow the group back to 17. And I know we're uh, going to have even better numbers, I'm sure, next year, but uh, that was pretty impressive. Um, the fifth grade band received a superior rating at the High Notes Music Festival in Great Escape. And we're per also prepared to play for the Utica Blue Sox this past Friday. But they got rained out. So they did put the time and effort into it, and they were all excited about that. And I think you gave them Cracker Jacks, right? They got Cracker Jacks. Cracker Jacks, so <laughs> they still got the price. Absolutely. Uh, sixth grade band was also prepared to play for the Blue Sox this past Friday, but they got rained out. Uh, the 8th grade instrumental and vocal musicians are performing tomorrow night for the Moving Up Ceremony. Um, the Chamber Choir performed with 10 other districts at the RFA Rap City Show Choir Festival this past fall. And uh, they also performed with four other districts with the professional a cappella group Fall in the House at the Clinton Performing Arts Center this year. So they were busy. Students also pro uh, provided the national anthem for the Which Way is the 5K sporting uh, 5K. Uh, various sporting events, including the Pat K. Hill Classic for the track um, invitational, and also for the ride for missing and exploited children this, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, jazz band received a gold rating at the New Hartford Jazz Fest and a gold rating at the uh, New York State School Music Association Major Festival, Organization Festival, as well as played a uh, Christmas concert for the Brookdale Retirement Home. Uh, concert band received a gold with distinction at the NISMA Majors and provided pep band music for homecoming as well as played an elementary ensemble. Um, and also they're going to be playing a graduation this, this weekend. The high school music department took 50 students and five chaperones uh, overnight to New York City just a couple weeks ago, which included a tour of Radio City Music Hall, a dinner cruise on the East River and Hudson River, we went to Madame Tussauds Wax Museum and a Broadway musical, which was Little Shop of Horrors. And I know the students uh, will have memories of that for the rest of their lives. So I think having said that, now we're into the good stuff, which is recognizing all of the individuals for all of their individual achievements. Um, if everybody is here, there's 55 students. I don't know if you're all here, but that says a lot for the students in grades 5 12, I think, in a district our size. So I'm going to read everybody alphabetically. They're not in grade order. And then as you hear your name, I will read what the student has done. And then one of the two uh, students, uh, one of the two teachers, either Mrs. Carbone or Mr. Lecheski, will hand out uh, the certificates. And then Ms. Hale will hand you a voucher for an ice cream truck that hopefully will be appearing outside pretty soon. So and I would say um, 
the ice cream is being provided by Fat, my younger sisters, and they told me not to beg, but I will beg for uh, help. They're always looking for help. The current Flat Earth Boosters president is now taking over as our district superintendent, so I'm sure he will be vacating that position. <laughs> so if anybody would like to run for president, there's an opening there, as well as uh, I know we have uh, our vice president doesn't even have any students involved anymore. So uh, if you are an ambitious parent and want to help with the Fine Arts Boosters, they would love to have you involved. So I will just kind of be the voice and let the department take over. So first, we will be recognizing Jamie Allen, who performed at the NISPA Solo Fest Level 3 Bassoon. Is Jamie here? OK, Hannah Alsante uh, was selected for to represent Sequoia in the elementary all-county choir. <clears throat> Jacob Bannis did a Level 5 clarinet solo and a Level 6 vocal solo at the NISMA Solo Festival. <laughs> Stephen Burnett auditioned for and represented Sequoia in the junior high all-county choir. Cameron Viamonte represented Sequoia in the elementary all-county band. Lillian Brennan uh, did a level two clarinet duet at NISMA and was also in the elementary all-county band. Addison Brown uh, did a level two clarinet duet and was, uh, yes, Addison Brown at NISMA. represented Sequoia in the Junior High All-County Choir. <laughs> Catherine Jugway would perform a level four clarinet solo this month. Carolina Karpovich uh, was a member of the Junior High All-County Band and also 
also did a level two clarinet duo, the duo at NISPA. did a level six soprano NISPA solo and was also the recipient of the SB Fab Choral Award and one of the, uh, no, well, I guess one of, one of the recipients for the SB Fab Fine Arts Award in memory of Stephen Burnham. Nisma solo for soprano and was also a member of the Junior High All County Choir.
Leo Roberts, who is a member of the Junior High All County Band. <laughs> Alex Sacco did a level two snare drum solo at NISMA. Sydney Salustio did a all state level flute solo at NISMA and was a member of the area all state band. Sophia Selmy was in the Junior High All County Band. <laughs> Emily Solcha uh, is a member of the Greater Utica Area Youth, Youth Honor Green Ensemble. <laughs> Cecilia Sumner did a level one tablet solo at this month. person is not here because they are at another music uh, rehearsal. Giovanni Stoddard uh, did a all-state level tenor solo at NISMA and was a member of the area all-state mixed choir. <laughs> Victoria Tarasevich was in the junior high all-county band. Gia Timian did an All-State Soprano 2 solo at NISMA and was in the area All-State Mixed Choir. <laughs> Our next student is at another rehearsal actually at Glimmer Glass Festival in, uh, outside of Cooperstown for a youth opera. Um, Callum Torella was, a, did a level 4 flute solo and an All-State Soprano 2 solo at NISMA and was also a member of the treble choir at Area All State. <laughs> Cassidy True Croy did a level one flute solo. <laughs> Jason Baber did a level one trombone solo. <laughs> Alzana Weeks did a level one trumpet solo at this one.
Okay. I'm just hitting this old button. Yep, that should do. We'll the find out, right? Yep. Okay. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yep. All right. Okay. So last spring, the Board of Ed approved me for a sabbatical to work. I was previously the eighth grade ELA teacher for nine years. And then when time before I retired, the position opened up, so I decided to come back to high school. Before I was at Sequoia, I taught um, 10, 11, 12th grade at Camp So I was like, well, let's go back to high school and see how So upon making that decision, I really wanted to start fresh, rebuild the entire curriculum, and um, Mr. Reed was gracious enough to say, yeah, I think you should do it. You all approved me for it. So what I did was uh, the district actually purchased this program called Curriculum Rehab. It's an online program. It's completely, it's like just modules that that little image is hard to see on the side, but it's basically modules that break down what are your goals, what's your vision for this course, and then how can you build it right from the foundation up. Um, it's by two women who run a program called Breaking Teaching. So I figured I was feeling a little overwhelmed about two classes, technically three because I was doing nine honors. So this is nine, ten, and nine honors. And this was a good way to kind of keep me in my lane because I felt like otherwise I was going to be overwhelmed. There we go. Okay, so what this whole program started with was asking you which, what are the philosophies that are going to drive your curriculum? And so a lot of these are the stuff that you do right in education programs. Backwards design is pretty much the foundation of any type of curriculum development. So you start with your assessment, you think about what your assessment is going to be, and then you work backwards from there to develop your unit. Uh, Inquiry-based teaching, so essential questions have been around for a really long time, but admittedly, I was not always using an essential question to drive an ELA unit. I might use an essential question to that's skills-based, like how can I revise a text to improve my argument, or how can I um, how can I use word choice to persuade my audience? But I wasn't necessarily using essential questions, and I'll get into that later on. So the idea is that rather than just books driving the curriculum, like we're going to teach Fahrenheit 451, you're not really using the book as much as you're using an idea to drive your curriculum. Conceptual vocabulary, so explicit and indirect vocabulary instruction. So the essential question they gave was like, instead of a dystopian unit, you might say, in what ways is America a dystopia? And then you would have to explicitly teach that term dystopia so that students have a really good foundation before they even start reading their texts. This kind of essential question teaching, oh, my watch is on top. <laughs> this kind of essential question teaching actually turns things back on the student. So it makes them more of an active learner or agent. Rather than me just saying, okay, we're gonna like read chapter two and identify essential conflict. It's more, it's more um, their responsibility. They have to tell me what they're seeing in the text rather than me telling them what to look for in the text. Zone of proximal development, that's just the idea that I have students, it, this year I taught a class that Noelle Curry pushed into, so I have students who have identified disabilities and I taught ninth grade honors, so I have students who are excelling in school. So what I want to do is make a plan that will stretch in both directions. It'll help my students, it'll scaffold for my students who might struggle in ELA, and then it'll challenge my strongest learners. So I'm trying to give them a variety of different texts that'll expose them to all different types of ideas. There we go. So the big pillars were create a program that has that encourages reading stamina, which is something students really struggle with um, when I teach independent reading. The first, usually the first time in this class students do independent reading. Some really struggle with just the first time in independent reading. Uh, encouraging discussion skills, a lot of Socratic seminars, a lot of time working in small groups or with partners discussing and exchanging ideas. Self-advocacy and self-direction, so students take that essential question and they kind of control the direction the class goes sometimes. Revising writing is a big part of this curriculum, and then improving expression and argument. And these pillars, I absolutely think, prepare students for the 11th grade Regents exam, which is really ultimately the goal. The Regents exam has an argument essay, it has a literary analysis essay on it, um, it has, I think the Regents was like 26 pages long this year. It is reading heavy, it is very reading heavy. 
So the goals are to prepare them for that exam without it feeling like we're just doing a whole bunch of tough prep. I wanted um, representational and diverse texts, different mediums, different genres, so that students could see how these different ideas overlap through all different aspects of our lives. I wanted to spiral and build on skills, so every unit hit reading, writing, um, discussion, argument, and it just repeated, and so I was able to teach and reteach research was something that we kind of tried to build in, Ms. Baggy and I actually try to build in and touch on some aspect of research in each unit. Being inquiry driven with that essential question, hope, which was kind of how I got students to be curious, like, my last unit with Fahrenheit 451, we called it the cancel culture unit. Like, is cancel culture effective? And most 10th graders were like, is it? Let's talk about it. Like, immediately, before we even picked up the book, they wanted to talk about cancel culture. They were, they were engaged. Concern yourself with modern, current, and important world events. So all of these essential questions end up being the kinds of things that were like, well, what just happened in the news the other day? Or what did you see last week on TikTok? Because those, those things end up coming back to our class discussions. And then just making them more informed citizens and being more critical about the messages that are being shared with them. So a good example of that is Ms. Babby and I, at the end of the year, and we're going to start the year of this next year, is we did a TikTok fact check. So we pulled in a TikTok video that looked to be informative, and then we asked students to analyze it. Like, who is our author? Like, what kind of authority does this author have? Where's the background? We showed them how to research and find out more information about him. And then we also had them fact check his information. And then we talked about, like, is this a reliable source? Is it not a reliable source? And so um, just getting them to think a little bit more critically because they're on their phones so much, getting them to think about like, what are they seeing when they're on their phones. So I'm going to get to my essential questions. I'm almost done. These essential questions are meant to tie together text, skills, and themes. So, it allows me to teach not just a novel, but short stories, articles, poetry, a TED Talk video, um, a TikTok video. I can pull in all different types of texts. They're the driving force behind the curriculum apps. They're very open-ended, thought-provoking, intellectually engaging. They require higher thinking, and kids really struggled with that at some points. Like, they would get a little angry because I'd say, okay, we're going to take this essential question today. We're going to apply it to chapter five. I just, I just don't really understand why we have to do this. Well, this is kind of the overarching idea of this entire unit. So where do you see it at play? Can you pull a piece of this text and show me where you think it's happening? And so those were the moments where I saw the most frustration from students because instead of just saying, like, here's your reading comprehension questions for chapter five, I said, you tell me what's the most important part of chapter five. Uh, they raise additional questions, definitely. And they require support and justification, which is also a big part of the regions. You have to be able to justify and support everything that you end up writing about. And life, basically. So I created a year-long essential question. And then, instead of a unit being just a title of a book, the unit was that essential question. So I'll actually give you some examples of that. So this is my English 9 curriculum. So my overarching my overarching question is how do we shape and form our identities? Because they're coming into ninth grade and they're trying to figure out who they are. So I started with what we would normally call a short story unit. But the essential question was how does being in a group affect how we behave? And so they read short stories that did this. We watched a lot of really cool psychology videos. We talked about the Milgram experiment. And then we came to the musical and there was a fire drill and no one moved. And they had just watched a video of um, an experiment where they put a bunch of people in a room and one person was a test subject and everyone else just sat there during a fire alarm. Then they poured smoke under a door and the one person just sat there and waited for all the other people to move and nobody would move. People waited in the room and smoked for 17 minutes in this time. And so they came into school on Monday and they were like, oh my gosh, the, the fire alarm was going off and everyone just stood there until Ms. Carbone said we should leave. <laughs> And then everyone left. And I was like, see, it was just so, it could not have been more perfect. We did a born a crime unit, and then our essential question was, how does our race, culture, upbringing shape who we are and who we become? My Romeo and Juliet unit was, which is more powerful, the head or the heart? 
which they got real upset. They thought they were going to like Romeo and Juliet, and they ended up hating Romeo and Juliet. They, they thought they were the dumbest characters they've ever met, which, was, which for me, I was like, yep, yep, that's it, guys. <laughs> They're not making really good choices. The Odyssey unit was our end of the year, close to our end of the year unit. How do the stories we tell reflect our identities and culture? We talked a lot about like Greek mythology and how those, what were those stories like, and then what are the stories that we tell, and how are those stories a reflection of? Or we also had this conversation of like there, um, they did a task two essay where we said, does TV reflect our culture, or do does our culture shape what's on TV? So that's how we ended that unit, and then we ended with the TikTok fact check. How are the stories we read today a reflection of our identity and culture? So it tied right in at the end of the Odyssey. And then for English 10, we use the essential question, who gets power and why? We started off with Julius Caesar. We talked about what makes a good leader. This was, I think, the unit they were nervous about, because it's Shakespeare. But when you frame it as what makes a good leader, you start getting really critical about Caesar, Mark Anthony, um, Brutus. Like, is this the guy you want running the place? Why? What would make him a good leader? or make him not a good leader. A lot of good questions about like world leaders and how there's like that gray area of what makes a good leader and not a good leader. Then we did Serial, which is a podcast, it's a true crime podcast, and we explored what is truth. You know, how truth can vary depending on who the person is, what their experiences are. For my Mice and Men unit, we did what's the relationship between power dynamics, otherness, and the American dream. We looked at how every character in that book is an other. You have somebody with a disability, you have somebody who's black during the Great Depression, you have a female during the Great Depression, so people who really were seen as other and kind of pushed to the side. Oh, did I keep my house unit? <laughs> my back, my TikTok check. My last unit, I should have updated this, my last unit was my Fahrenheit 451 unit, and that question was, um, is cancel is cancel culture a justifiable or useful means of social uh, social justice? And so, those are my those are my units that I thought. Melissa, how does this differ from what you would have done if you did do what you did? That's a good question. Okay, so in the past, I think the middle school runs more on skill based. So we're going to work on finding the main idea, and then we're going to do a whole bunch of different activities with finding the main idea. Then we're going to work on developing theme. How does an author develop theme? theme? So we go right through the skills and work on those skills one at a time. In the past, when I taught high school English, everything was just a, a book. So I taught Lord of the Flies, and I taught, you know, taught Lord of the Flies. In other words, we read a chapter, they answered multiple choice questions, they might have a quiz, they might have a vocab quiz. Um, you might write an essay at the end of the unit, but it wasn't looking beyond the text. It was more like, okay, you're going to read Lord of the Flies because it's this classic text that everyone reads. Or you're going to read Romeo and Juliet because it's Shakespeare. Instead of reading Romeo and Juliet and thinking about how is this relevant to my life and how is this relevant to like, the world around us. So it, gave, it gives you a ton of wiggle room as far as what other texts you want to bring in because you can find other stories like Romeo and Juliet that are modern. You can find you know, a short episode or something on YouTube. You can bring in all these different things. So I, I feel like it's more applicable to like, this holistic experience. It's, it's definitely more engaging for students because if you don't like Shakespeare, you don't like Shakespeare. But if you start thinking about like, well, what does make a good leader? And then we start talking about student elections because there's student council, like who do you pick for student council president? Do you pick the most popular kid? Or do you pick the kid that you know is gonna attend every meeting and fight for that bonfire in the fall or something of that nature? So I'd say that's probably the biggest difference. I was gonna ask if you find that students are more engaged with this approach versus, like you said, just teaching Lord of the Flies and having a... a I think so, because I think when you just teach, we're reading Lord of the Flies, if you don't like Lord of the Flies, you have to sit through like a five-week unit reading a book you don't like. But if you don't like Lord of the Flies and you're doing, you're thinking about Lord of the Flies through this lens, 
then it's really, the Lord of the Flies is just like this little vehicle that gets you to the other fun stuff that you do in class. So it's not so much like I have to read this book. I'm reading this book so I can do these other things with it. So I do think the students are more engaged. But it's more fun for me too because if, if I'm being honest, like if I had to just read a chapter of Lord of the Flies and answer multiple choice questions or answer reading really comprehension questions for like four periods, that would be boring. But when we read a chapter and then they have to start finding evidence from that chapter to support an essential question. Now every class is different. You know, kids absolutely blow me away with the stuff that they pull out and the things that they see that I didn't see because they're bringing their own experiences to the test. I think it's neat that you have like classic Romeo and Juliet and then you have a section on TikTok mm -hmm. that, you know, you've got that extreme uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It really Probably. relates to them, but yeah, they're still they're still doing the classics. But yeah, you're right, Tony. They're, they're doing something at their level. that's at their level. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I think there's like a value to those classic tests, like of mice and men or Romeo and Juliet. Like we talked about, I feel like every kid should be exposed to Shakespeare. They should have that foundation because it's so prevalent in so many other aspects of our culture. Just the phrase, they already know who Romeo and Juliet are. They already know Romeo and Juliet are going to die before we even read the play. But then there's also that value in getting them to think critically about TikTok. Even though it's like, it's TikTok. Like, whatever, you can just watch, you can watch 100 TikTok videos in 20 minutes. When you force them to stop and really think about what's happening, that TikTok video becomes as challenging as a Shakespeare does. And this daddy saw that because they get frustrated. <laughs> What is his purpose? Well, what do you think his purpose is? Well, how am I supposed to figure out what is he saying? What kind of music is he using? What kind of special effects are in this video to get you to feel a certain way? So you're able to kind of tie the two together, and it's more fun for the students. Now, where did you find this? Or how did you come so, to So I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I like to listen to educational podcasts. Brave New Teaching is an educational podcast by two high school English teachers. And they do all different episodes on different aspects of ELA instruction, and they mention this, and I was like, this is what I want. I think this is what I need to, to help me stay focused, because otherwise my brain would be like, everywhere. I think this is great. It has to be so engaging for the kids to be able to use different kinds of media to spark those conversations, because it uh, definitely would have been a lot more interested than just reading plain text and it. Um, especially when you're listening to a podcast like Serial, which mm -hmm. came out maybe it depends on which, which episode, but if it's a song, you know, yeah. fast forward a decade later, <laughs> it's being released from Brisbane, and it, that is real time. So yeah. what you're listening to and dissecting is, is ever changing, and it keeps them engaged. Serial was really fun because um, Serial was released, I think, in 2004, but right in the fall, in November, the man who was convicted in Serial was released um, by the same people that convicted him. So I kept telling him, students, do not Google his name. Like, do not go and find out what happens. You have to wait and see what happens. And then at the end, it's really fun to be like, well, look what was in the news just last month. Yeah. What well, was really fun. And they liked cereal. Yeah, for um, Serial, we did a lot. One of our other essential questions, like our skill essential question was, what makes a good story? And how can you craft a story? And what's good, what good storytelling is, creating suspense, bringing in point of view. You end up talking about all those aspects of literature, but you're using a podcast instead. So we enjoyed that. Did you find the kids learned maybe better or more from each other? Yeah, it really lends itself well to partner or small group instruction. Like, there's not much that I can do in front of the classroom. There's days, a lot of my days in front of the classroom were modeling how to write a good response, things like that. But most of the time, it was them working in small groups as opposed to me. It allows you to facilitate yeah. learning a lot more and probably focus on some of the kids that struggle mm -hmm. a little bit. I think there's a lot of power in kids understanding how their fellow classmates learn and understand something. And you allowing that to happen lends itself to that. And it takes the paradigm shift from probably how you did teach yeah. to how you want to teach and where it's of value to the students. Yeah. 
much more, and they don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, they, you know, they didn't realize these days. You say they're doing a lot of the work. Now. Yeah. Um, and you're just allowing it to happen, but it takes careful planning to do that. And I, like I said, there were students this year that I think surprised themselves and surprised other students. Like there's a quiet student who doesn't say much, or maybe they have a disability, so they need the room for tests and things of that nature. And all of a sudden, they're the master room with Juliet. And they're saying they are, they know that knob or that plate inside out because they get they're getting it, you know, at a different level. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. I, we've, uh, I, I don't 
I don't believe we have to submit anything that we were tasked to to do this, I would say. So yes, we've met our threshold, okay. I think, as far as what we do, where we come up with a mascot, obviously, you know, being mindful of how it represents us and, and how it looks, but uh, I think with the new nickname, we should be able to come up with something that will certainly be uh, appropriate and, um, and uh, move forward. We do have, um, it was funny, this, you know, when this came out in November, spent a lot of time kind of looking throughout the buildings and we didn't catch everything, but you see that then we get outside and it's kind of oblivious to some of the things. So we, we have some, uh, some of our old logos that do need to come down outside on uh, uh, athletic scoreboards on baseball and softball field. I think dug out of the softball field. Um, there's, a, there's a board, a uh, plywood sign that was made by the art department uh, years ago uh, that has a, has a logo on it. And then we have um, two kind of cast bronze um, emblems as we enter the stadium. Beautiful, but uh, they all need to come down. And uh, we took a drive in our dump truck, and noticed when I got out of hand after taking the trip to Syracuse with it, it, uh, it also has a logo on there that needs to come off. So um, I, uh, you know, we'll continue to certainly, now our task is to go through and, and with fidelity, make those, um, you know, make those corrections, and then prepare ourselves to uh, launch a new mascot and logo. And, and I think, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, engage the student body and, and the public in getting behind that and, and the rebranding um, to play value. That's all I have for subcommittee. Okay, next move on to superintendent's report. I had two things, but we already recognized John Miller. So we'll, uh, <laughs> that was one. Um, but no, thank you again um, for, for all your time on the board um, in, in support of the district and uh, certainly everything we, we do as employees of the district. Um, and just a reminder, graduation, June 23rd, uh, right now it's scheduled inside the high school gymnasium, 7 o'clock. Uh, be there 6.15, 6.30, Michelle? So if you're there between 6.15, 6.30, we'll get you situated um, where, where, where we'll, we'll be sitting, and then uh, we will celebrate our class of 2023 on Friday night. I did receive a, a question from a parent that asked, will we be live streaming the graduation? Okay. We don't have that plan. We don't? Okay. It, it is open to, right now there's no restrictions on who can attend, right? But yep. Like, like, yep. Like, but you're a Oh, we don't have anything under old business. Next, we'll move on to new business. I'll read 8.1 to 8.26 as a consent agenda. If anyone has any questions or would like anything pulled for further discussion, please let me know. First is um, 8.1, appointment of teacher. 8.2, appointment of mentor teacher. 8.3, appointment of substitute laborer. 8.4, rate of pay for summer help. 8.5, appointment of student summer help. 8.6, appointment of athletic director. 8.7, appointment of director of technology. 8.8, .8, appointment of instructional technology coaches. 8.9, resignation. 8.10, resignation. 8.11, appointment of substitute bus driver. 8.12, request, request to create a clerk of the works position. 8.13, Board of Education meeting dates. 8.14, salaries for confidential employees 2023-2024. 8.15, athletic appointments, fall 2023-24. 8.16, adoption of district safety plan. 8.17, approval of Mohawk Valley Action Agency, excuse me, Action Agency Inc. Agreement. 8.18, BOCES Annual Service AS7 Contract. 8.19, approval of the sale of surplus vehicles. 8.20, approval to fund the Teacher Retirement System Contribution Reserve. 8.21, approval to fund the Retirement contribu Contribution Reserve Fund. 8.22, Treasurer's Report of Balances. 8.23, Resolution Authorizing Payment of Bills Approved by the Claims Auditor. 8.24, Approval of Minutes of the June
June 6, 2023 meeting. 8.25, approval of minutes of the June 14, 2023 special meeting. And 8.26, committee and special education recommendations. There's a lot there. Does anyone have any questions or would like anything pulled for further discussion? I will abstain from 8.15. putting back in and you're pulling out and not hooking back in it only lasts for so long and can get you by similar to grant money and grant funding so um, you know if allowed you know creativity can come into play there without um, you know a consistent uh, um, need for it perhaps you could draw from it down a little bit and then add a little bit back and, and, and kind of just help manage I think in a perfect world would be you know what what you would do with those those kind of funds so, uh, um, it, it's good to at least have a place to put them in now. And I would say a goal of the future is, is trying to get a capital reserve fund going. Uh, I think that's a great fund to have for a district. Certainly help with ongoing projects, um, but uh, we're not there yet. But this, this is helpful, um, but, uh, but we'll see where the future lies. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we'll move on to miscellaneous topics. should be on the committee? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, I can work, I mean, we assign typically at the reorg meeting, we'll assign what board members are going to be on. Yep, there. but aside from the board members. Uh, aside well, from the board, it, you know, it, it would vary um, depending on what, you know, for example, policy committee, it may not always be the same people. You might be, depending on what policy is, you may drop from, you know, it could be, um, I'm yeah. specifically thinking technology. It's, in there's technology. quite a few players on the board for technology. So is it, again, going to just kind of depend on the topics being discussed? I, I think so. Obviously, I mean, you know, your director of technology would be part of that. Um, you know, there may be times when the building principal appropriate to have them in here as well. If not, but given we have instructional, techno instructional technology coaches, depending on what's getting discussed, you know, maybe some representation from them would come in 
Uh, and some of those committees certainly not always have to do with, with policy, but just, you know, what are we doing in the, in the realm of those particular uh, things. I know in the past when I would frequently hold those or more commonly hold those, um, you know, it would be a reporting out of where we are, kind of state of the state type of thing. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's something that should probably certainly be revisited often. I, I know early on I found that, you know, sometimes you're holding these meetings and like, tough to get people to come, um, but also it's tough to find some of the topics. But it doesn't mean you go great lengths in, in between of doing things, because technology has certainly evolved. But the, and like I think a good example of hearing what um, you know Mrs. Leone did over the summer talking on that, something to those effects, um, is certain I know I've talked a little bit with David already about that, would be a, a nice way, I think, to try to reinvigorate some of those, but do it with purpose and do it with timeliness. Uh, without inundating people with time and saying, okay, we're meeting because for the sake of meeting. Uh, so I think certainly striking the balance is, is, is helpful. Any other miscellaneous topics? There is one announcement. We, uh, we do have refreshments there, folks, and, and please join us in appreciation for everything that Don and Ron have done. Ron, we've been to three retirement dinners and parties for you, so I think tonight's done tonight. We, <laughs> Thank we you. We brought some refreshments. <laughs> <laughs> we've got some pastries, we've got food, we've got yeah. drinks, and we want to thank Don for what she's done, Rob. You've been great, but I think we got to step aside. Move on. Move on. It's done. It's done nice tonight. Heard and understood. <laughs> Thanks, Don. We have plenty, so feel yeah. free to stay. Although the ice tea's warm now. Need a motion then to adjourn at 8.09? Sure. Tony, a second, please. Tony? Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, all those in favor? Aye. Aye.